January 1954. An eastbound J-1 is rolling a long freight on the Toledo Division at Bloomfield, Ohio. Here's some footage of the conductor's point of view. So these um, these trains were something else. Um, basically, my theory is after whatever reset event uh, happened and ancestors came over here or whatnot the you know giants fell they left magnificent buildings it's pretty clear now that there's no way that uh, they were constructed in the timeline I was told it was the same thing with these engines so right here I cut out the sound um, it said something like, oh, these men are repairing a section of track before before the such and such number 301 came through. That's BS. They were, they were destroying the track. They weren't repairing it. You know, you're going to repair it with the train going full speed right at you. And, uh, just a nick of time, I guess. And then another... This guy's also hacking away at the tracks, probably, so they can just scrap the steel. That's another thing, I mean, laying these tracks. You understand that these trains, when they're going at, you know, at speed, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles per hour and, and up, any deviation in this track, you know, dip, a little, whatever, you know, not spaced out off by an inch, you know, elevations off by an inch, that whole train's out of there, you know, they laid it all, nah, that's, that's bogus, it's countless miles of, uh, train tracks laid across this, uh, continental U.S. and North America, for that matter, um, and all this, you know, um, Look here at North American Railroad. Mind you, same thing was going on in Britain. Okay, across the pond, they had many locomotives. You know, you can look into that. They shipped a bunch of them to India. And I guess there was track already over there. I haven't looked too much into that, but I mean, here we go. Uh, passing up another locomotive. Looks like this guy. You know, like I said, they were just kind of the Wild West and trying to figure out how these things are going to go. Looks like this guy got it going, but puffing out a bunch of black smoke. You know, he probably can't probably burn it up. But who cares? Uh, you know, there's a famous um, event that happened where they basically slammed two trains into each other. Somewhere in Texas, and 
sold tickets to it. Yeah, let's just slam these two trains together, you know. Fuck it. Sell some tickets, whatever, man. That's, that's the best they could do. Um, and also, let's look at the background here. All white, you know. And by the way, what great switches and you know bridges and all that is very well done. But everything in the background is white. Uh, channel UAP kind of turned me on to that. Um, how everything's whitewashed, and because who knows what was in the background, you know, larger buildings and stuff like that. No telling. Um, so I think what they did is they took these film, you know, the, the film reel, and they went over it and painted uh, frame by frame, white everywhere. That's why you can see. Let me try to pause it. Um, you see some of these little white dots that appear. You know, as, oh, they're just uh, you know scratches on the film or whatever. I believe that that's white paint. You know, you know, frame by frame, each frame, they do a good job, but it's not going to be perfect, you know. A little smidge here, a little drop there. That's what we got. Drops. Bright white spots. See, there goes one there. And there's one there. It's just from picking up the brush and dripping paint. We're going to paint out everything in the background, and that's pretty much the characteristic of many, many, many film reels dating back to the turn of the century. Definitely 1800s. It's going to be whitewashed. What is this? It's an interesting uh, looking locomotive there. Incredible. Uh, I don't know. It's plowing through the snow. Amazing. Simply amazing. So taking a look at the Santa Fe locomotive, here you can see no steam coming out, when it gets up to speed, as they said in another video, you shovel about five or six shovelfuls of coal and then get it up to speed once the steam's, you know, this is running off steam, it goes about two, two and a half hours. And it just uses the same steam, recycles it, condenses the water, so on and so forth. Uh, like that one conductor said, and about this uh, this speed, would be about 750 degrees uh, steam. Yeah, no emissions uh, except for steam. Going back to the history of it, um, there's a little bit about, I was reading about, ironically enough, on the Henry Ford uh, website, the henryford.org. Um, came across this, Newton's laws are very simple to state, yet many students find these laws difficult to grasp and to work with. Newton, yeah, well, so maybe they need to be revisited. <laughs> Drivers are a one-piece cast steel uh, box box casting. This is uh, much preferred to the old obsolete spoke type drivers. For one thing, it's much stronger. For another, it's easier to balance, and that's very important in a higher speed locomotive such as the 844. The rods are made of a, of a very high strength alloy. It's a, van a manganese vanadium allo alloy. You'll notice they're not very big. They have a very, very high section modulus with very high strength. Uh, rod failures were virtually unknown with, this lo with these locomotives. Three parts. You 
start out with the cold water pump. That's a steam driven turbine pump that takes water right out of the tender, right through this hose. And the water in the tender is at whatever temperature, uh, ambient temperature. Cold water pump pumps the water up into a box up in the top of the smoke box, right ahead of the exhaust stack. And there, of course, inside that stack, the temperatures vary from 12 to 1800 degrees. There's a box inside there with a cooling co with a coil in it. The cold water goes through the coil. The coil is surrounded by the exhaust steam. The exhaust steam heats the water. It heats it to almost 300 degrees, already past the boiling point. From that point, the preheated water goes to the hot water pump. And the hot water pump is right here. This is a piston type pump. And it takes, the, it takes the preheated water out of the smoke box and pumps it into the boiler. The reason it's a piston type pump is it has to ram that water in against the 300 pounds boiler pressure that's trying to come back out through the pipe. You turn the whole works on with a little valve in the cab that starts the steam turbine pump and it starts the water pump pumping back and forth, pumping the water in. Okay, we'll put her in gear. Keep the brakes off and go. Most railroads back in steam days didn't trust the builders to do their own design work. Each railroad had its own engineering staff, its own huge design staff, and each railroad felt that it had to have custom built power. And if the Union Pacific designed an extraordinary locomotive, the rest of the railroads would say, well, that's fine for the UP, but we've got to have our own. UP work was uh, very close to American Locomotive Company. The largest and most modern locomotives on the UP were built as a cooperative effort with, with ALCO. Their design staff and the railroad's design staff worked very closely together. And there were some disagreements and there were some fine arguments uh, if you read the minutes of some of the meetings. The UP developed the first high-speed 484s. Uh, we did not develop the 484 type, but we did develop it into a high-speed locomotive. The railroad was looking for passenger locomotives that could run 90 miles an hour on flat track with 26 cars. And the UP produced a design, the builder produced a design. The two designs were very far apart. There were a number of things that the UP had tried that the builder said was impossible. So there was quite a bit of give and take. And finally they said, look, it's our money. Build a locomotive the way we said. If it doesn't work, then it's our problem. They built it. It exceeded everybody's expectations and it proved to the industry that a, a big locomotive that could pull both freight and passenger economically could be built. The locomotive has a one-piece cast steel frame. That means the entire frame from the pilot all the way back to under the cab was one giant sand casting, one-piece cast steel. On older locomotives, more primitive locomotives, the frame was built up of hundreds of individual pieces. The bolts would work loose, they would break over time, the frame would bend, uh, the wheels would get out of alignment and all that. That's not a problem with a cast steel underframe. It, it makes a very solid foundation.